This video is all about understanding the mix window inside of Pro Tools, which looks like this. And if you are a beginner, this is a crucial video for you to watch because this is 50% of Pro Tools, really. It is this window and it is the edit window. And back to the mix window, that's what we're talking about today. But even if you're an intermediate or advanced user, there might be some stuff you missed. So if you don't feel like you fully understand this window, stick around for this video, it's for you. Welcome to the video. My name is Malcolm Owenflood. I teach DIY audio stuff and Pro Tools stuff here on YouTube. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, please do subscribe. I'd love to have you around. And like I said, in today's video, we're going to be talking about the mix window inside of Pro Tools. This is the mix window. This is the edit window. I do a lot in the edit window, but this video is not going to cover that at all. There will be another video coming later about what this page is and how I specifically use it to make it kind of the only window I need to see in Pro Tools, but that's not coming right yet. So if you want that, please do subscribe. For now, let's cover this mix window. The first thing I want you to do is start visualizing a real physical mixer in front of you. If you've ever had a mixer for your jam space or for a live sound venue, you've probably noticed that it's arranged in strips. You plug an XLR in the back and then you've got a trim knob or a gain knob at the top to decide how loud the signal is coming in. Maybe an EQ section, maybe some reverb or effects, and then a pan knob and then a fader where you can decide, you know, how loud it is getting sent to the speakers. That is exactly what we're looking at here. We've got a channel for every single thing. So take the click track here, for example, on the far left, this is a strip. So let's start with the click track here on the left. We're going to work our way down the signal chain. And then I'm going to show you some hidden stuff that you can't see right now after we're done all of this as well. So this is the crucial stuff, but there is some more cool stuff that you're going to want to be able to see as well. The first section we're going to look at is the insert section. So starting at the top here, we are looking at the insert section and you'll notice that it says inserts A through E and inserts F through J. And all this is, is meaning that you have five spots. So A through E is of course five spots and F through J is another five spots. And inserts are where we do individual processing on our audio for that channel. So in the case of this being a click track, anything I throw on here, take this EQ for example, is going to affect only that metronome click track. So let's kind of show you that. I'll click play, you'll hear a metronome and then I'll mess with it. So now we hear it. And now I'm filtering it out, right? So we can apply whatever processing we want to the click track by just inserting an insert right here. I could throw a reverb, a compressor, whatever you want. If you've got it, you can throw it there. Now the audio moves through these plugins from top to bottom. So the order of the plugins will affect how the next plugin reacts. Because if I boost a bunch of top end here and then have a reverb here, that reverb is now reacting to that brightened signal. That's important to know as well. Now, the next thing we hit is our sends. Now, sends you can think of as a shared processing. So right now we have one called reverb and that is sending to this track right beside the click, which is our reverb bus or reverb send and return. So we can send audio out from our click trap to this reverb bus and that will then go through a reverb plugin, which I have right here. And then finally be sent out to our speakers so that we can hear the signal of the click track with some reverb. Let's do that right now. I'll show you that in real time. So I would click on our reverb bus here, which I've already created and I'll click play and I'll slowly turn it up and we will hear reverb be added to this mix. Here we go. There we go. So you just heard reverb be added to the signal essentially. If you're a little confused about that and interested in that, I'm also going to have another video coming out about how to specifically make and create sends and returns and buses for whatever you could need, including parallel processing inside of Pro Tools. So that's a video coming up. So subscribe if you want to check out that sort of thing. But for right now, it's just enough to know that's where the sends live. That's where this section is kind of being applied is for stuff like shared processing or maybe side chaining as well. The only thing that's different from a physical mixer and Pro Tools visually is the I.O. here, because you can think of the I.O. as where you plug the mic in on a mixer. The I stands for input and the O stands for output. So the I being the input is where is the audio coming from if you are recording in to this channel. So if I had a, a mic plugged into channel one, I'd go to interface channel one. And then I go to the output and decide where I want the music to play to. So in this case, I'm sending to the mains, which is 
you know, my mix bus essentially in this scenario. So that, you know, is a little different because we normally are used to that being at the top, but for whatever reason it lives here, but know that nothing you do with your processing is going to affect the IO. It's just where it is in the picture of things. Now, the next thing is a more advanced thing that you don't need to worry about too much, but we do want to cover everything. So you at least understand what's going on. And this says auto and that stands for automation. So automation is when you can control parameters on your channel to replicate themselves in real time while you are playing a song back. Now, what does that actually mean? It means that you can program volume faders moves or plugin parameter changes in real time to only happen at certain instances in your song. And that's actually really cool because you might want this click track to turn down at a certain section that a drummer needs to kind of ignore it for. That's just an example. Another example could be you want the guitars to get louder in the course so you can automate the volume of your guitars up a couple dB for a section of the song. Again, we're not going to go into how to automate. It's just all about knowing what these things are. Now, if we click that, there's these different modes, and that's a little too advanced for this video too, but know that read is kind of the default, and that means that it is going to respond to any automation that has been written. So if you ever accidentally write automation, you can just go click that off, and it'll ignore any automation on that channel. And right below that, you should probably see a button that probably says no group. And this means that this track hasn't been applied to a group. And a group is just a way of linking multiple tracks together. So take my bass guitar group here for example. If I open that up, I usually track a couple different bass signals. I normally have a DI and an amp, and then maybe I've got like an extra parallel processing going on as well. In this case, I've got three. And you can see that their group says B underscore bass, which is just a custom group name that I have made so that I can edit these all together inside of my edit window. Again, not very relevant to today's video, but at least you know what it is now. After that, we get to our pan knob, and this one's pretty self-explanatory. It lets you pan the signal from left to right. So if I click play, I can pan it left, and now we are going right, which is maybe mirrored because I've got a camera. I can never remember how that works out. But essentially, it lets you decide where in the stereo field the audio is actually playing from, and that's crucial. You're going to want to use that, trust me. Let's go back to zero with that. And finally, we get to our main controls for the channel, and that is solo, mute, and volume. Solo will do exactly what you think it will. It will just play only the tracks that are soloed, and you can get multiple tracks soloed together to hear just pairs of instruments together. Then of course we can mute them. So now I've muted it and we don't hear the click track anymore because it is muted. I unmute it, we hear it. Simple as that. And then this is our actual volume. Now, this volume is how we mix our music, essentially. By adjusting this, it's going to decide the levels of all the different tracks we have. And I've got a lot more tracks than it looks like here. They're all hidden in these folders, which we'll get to folders. Essentially, the mix is decided by the balancing and leveling of these faders. And that's the most important part. Of course, we're using EQ and compression, all that stuff, but volume is most of it. So faders, crucial. What's important to know about the fader is, yes, you're turning it up or down, but where is it going? And that comes back to this IO channel where we are looking at our output. So we are sending to the mains. In this case, the click track is going to the main. So I have to find a track that is receiving the mains. And I have named my mix bus mains. And if we look at our input, it matches, it says mains. So again, output of the click track says mains, input of the mains track says mains. Those two match, that means that I am sending from the click track to our mains input. And if I click play with this turned all the way down, we're not seeing any signal on the mains because I've turned it down. And as I turn it up, there we go. We see it coming in. And if I click mute, no signal to the mains anymore, right? Because it has been muted. So that is the signal flow. It's coming in from the top, going through our processing, getting through this volume fader and being sent to wherever we decide, in this case, the mains channel. And then from there, the mains are sending it out further, as you can see, but that's not really relevant. That's the essentials of signal flow inside of Pro Tools right now. We've done it. <laughs> but of course, it looks like there is some other stuff going on, so we should cover all of that as well. If we look at the channel right beside our click, our reverb or any of these folder tracks here, actually, you'll notice that there's two pan knobs. And when there are two pan knobs, you'll also notice that at the fader, there is two 
fader volume meters as well, which I kind of forgot to cover, but you can see how much volume you are sending with this little meter right here. Now, that is important because a stereo track is essentially two tracks of audio and one is going hard left and one is going hard right, at least if you leave these pan knobs defaulted. So if we look at our reverb, for example, we can see that there's two channels going on and I can pan the reverb all the way right by taking the left channel and panning it right, or vice versa, pan it all the way left. So we have control over the stereo image on stereo tracks as well, but they do default to hard left and hard right, which is probably what you're gonna wanna do the majority of the time. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, this makes sense, but I've seen some other stuff on the channels. This doesn't look like other videos I've seen. There was a EQ section, like a, a graphic EQ, for example, maybe something else. This is a little hidden thing that isn't super obvious, if I'm honest. <laughs> but if you right click in between or on the titles of these sections, rather than on the actual like send or insert. So right now I'm gonna click on sends F through J, for example, right click. It brings up this display panel. And this lets you add a bunch of different stuff. And some I've used a lot and like to keep present in all my sessions. Some I've never used. For example, mic preamps, I've never used that. I think that is a native integration with like Avid Pro Tools unique preamps that pair with Pro Tools, but I'm not sure, never needed to use it. So I've never had it checked. Instrument, this would be uh, another kind of like specific MIDI syncing, I believe. Again, never needed to use it. I never have it up. Heat is another processing that I sometimes use, but not very relevant to you guys learning this stuff. But EQ curve, you might like this one. Let's click that on. And it shows an EQ curve of what's going on with our track. Now, I actually don't leave this one on, but I could see why you would want to. So what I just did is on our click track, I've got an EQ on the insert, and I just inserted a big top end boost. And you can now see that we can visualize that right from the channel view. We don't have to click the the plugin to see that there's a top end boost on the click track. It's visible to us just from here. And if I brought that over to uh, the reverb, for example, turn that on, and then this big, big bottom end boost, you know, you can start seeing how you can kind of visually get feedback of how things are EQ'd pretty quick just with a glance having that enabled. So it is kind of a cool feature. Object's another one I've never used. It's for controlling MIDI events, I believe, but that's not my cup of tea, so it's not something I need. Uh, if it is something you need, of course, look it up and know that it's available there. But another one that I keep on all the time is delay compensation. And delay compensation is really important, but hopefully something you don't have to think about too much because Pro Tools kind of handles it for us. But you need to make sure it is handling it for you. And to give you the short version of what it is, is that when you load a plugin on a track, that causes some latency. So what Pro Tools will do is figure out how much latency it's causing and then delay the rest of the tracks to compensate for that so that that delay track plays in time with the rest of the tracks. And that creates our mix staying together. You don't want to have, like insert an amp sim on guitar and now the guitar is, you know, half second late. This keeps track of it all and makes sure it's playing back as we intended. So once we've turned delay compensation on, you can now see it's down at the bottom here. It shows how much the signal is delayed and how much it is compensating by. And the compensation is determined by all of the plugins in the session. So I've got tons going. It doesn't look like it in this view, but if I open up all the tracks, there are numerous plugins and sends and stuff like that all over the place and a lot of complex routing. So it's taking care of all of that for me which is great there, some more up the top there. Now you can see them. Lots and lots of plugins, big session. So Pro Tools is doing all that math in real time and keeping track of it for me. And as long as this is green, I don't have to worry about it. If it's red, I do have to worry about it. If it's orange, you can pretty much ignore it still as well. But red essentially means that there is so much compensation that it can't compensate correctly and you will run into issues. So. I keep this on so I can glance at it, make sure things are looking good. And then the final other one that I really like is comments. And comments is useful while you're tracking because it opens up this text box at the bottom. And I could say, hey, we changed the click to have reverb. You know, leave yourself a note. Or we decided to change the tempo from 110 to 120. You know, leave yourself feedback or whatever, just to help yourself remind, like remind yourself. You can put the settings of your guitar amp in there if you want to recall that guitar tone later. Anything you could need, you can write it in there. Super handy. And 
Now I'll show you the way I like it. I turn off EQ curve because I just don't feel like I need to see that. I do leave notes up even though I don't use them that often and delay compensation. I never find myself needing more than the five channels of sends. So I would close that up and this is it. This is my view essentially. Uh, maybe I have heat open as well. It lives over here if you own that plugin. So that's kind of my view. Now let's explore a little bit deeper. See, we just keep going deeper. You've got the individual tracks, but now we need to kind of understand the left or right. Things are colored differently, obviously. And that is my own personal preference. I've colored it this way. And to change the color, you click at the bottom and that will bring up a color panel. And for the track you have selected, it will change accordingly. So I've got the reverb selected and I can make it whatever color I want. Let's go with hot pink, I like it. And now inside of that, there are these blue tracks. Now they don't have to be blue, but what you'll notice that's different about them is that they have this little picture of a folder right at the bottom. And I'll zoom in on that for you. Now, if you click that, it can hide tracks that are inside of it. And this is actually easier to visualize on the edit window. So here is the same track that special effects bus is really what this is. And I've got two tracks inside of that. And you can see that they're kind of set into it. And I'll pull them out so you can see that visually. If I do this, now they're on their own, but now I'm plopping them into that folder. And I can close them and hide it like that. And this next one, the keys bus is actually the same thing. It's a folder bus, but it looks different than the special effects bus you'll notice. And that is because the folder bus lets me have processing. It's kind of like a bus, but also a folder where this is just a folder. And it's a small difference. You don't really need to worry about that too much, but I want you to understand what you're seeing when you're seeing people's sessions. And the big advantage of folder tracks is of course that we can hide things. So I can make this giant session disappear real quick to look like that, opposed to this where it is giant. There's just endless stuff, right? And this is kind of a small one. <laughs> So it's a way of organizing it, keeping it small. But even though it is massive, the whole system works just like I explained to you with audio going in from the top and out the bottom and the sends being routed and having ins and outs all selected. It's, there's, that's all there is to it, honestly. It's that simple. And you can, of course, drag and drop things as you want. So if you want to have your mix bus and master fader on the far left, you just highlight them drag them over, now they live over there. You know, if you wanted to have your uh, drums on the far left, you could just grab your whole drum folder, move it over there, open it up. Now all your drums are living on the left. It's really customizable. And actually, I think you can even insert, like on the newest version of Pro Tools, which I'm not running right now, you can just drag and insert plugins, like reorder the stack really easy. It's that simple. Now to give you a couple more bonus tips, if you hold option and click a plugin, you can drag that over to other channels. It makes copies of it and it'll carry over the settings as well. Super handy. And I think that is really all you need to know about the mix window inside of Pro Tools. There's a lot of information. Uh, I'll try and have little markers dropped into the YouTube video of this. So you can just kind of jump around, refresh yourself as need, bookmark it, whatever you need to do. If you think I missed something, drop a comment and I'll try and get another video out for you that covers that as well, because that's what I want to do. I want to help you learn Pro Tools and record music faster, better, more easily. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, give a thumbs up, leave me a comment down below, and I'll see you in the next video, which is coming up right here and right here. Adios.